All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, the next in our uh, spring webinar series, Teaching with the ACRL Framework. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing authority is constructed and contextual, uh, which is the frame that we're talking about today. Um, just as a reminder, this session is being recorded. Um, it will be posted to YouTube um, probably sometime next week, uh, where it'll be available for anyone to watch. Um, uh, all attendees uh, who attended live will receive a certificate of attendance um, that they can use to show for uh, professional development. Um, so let me get up uh, my slides here. Screen share. And let's start the slideshow. All right, so authority is constructed and contextual. Um, as I mentioned, my name is uh, Glenn J. Benedict. I am the Access Services Librarian at uh, the University of the District of Columbia. Um, my contact information is there up on the screen. We were just moved into our new temporary location and our phones are all set up. So, um, so those are working. Uh, so the frame that we are talking about today is, as I mentioned, uh, authority is constructed and contextual. And so when we say authority, um, you know, what we're talking about is, you know, I have a little definition here up on the on the left there, uh, a type of influence recognized or exerted within a community. Um, so I think a lot of us are familiar with, you know, physical influence or physical force being used. So, you know, police, governments, um, that sort of thing. But, um, uh, you know, authority, when we're talking about it in the academic sense, um, can refer to um, people who, you know, people who have um, the importance of, you know, uh, within their, their disciplines, within their fields, um, people who have influence, people who are considered to be reliable, credible sources. Um, so that's what we're talking about. Um, so information resources reflect their creator's expertise and credibility, and they're evaluated based on the information need and the context in which the information will be used. Um, so when we say that authority is constructed, um, you can kind of think of it like a building or a wall, that there's a lot of pieces and components that go into building your own authority that um, you construct it over time. No one is born uh, an expert in any particular topic. Um, and certainly personal experience um, is something um, that can be used to build authority as can study. Um, whether it's academic or, you know, just as a hobby, your personal uh, interests. These are all different ways that we can construct authority. Um, and authority is also contextual in that uh, the information need may help to determine the level of authority required. So somebody who is an authority on uh, a topic um, as we talked about before, there are different ways of building authority, and you might want to go to people who have uh, authority in a field uh, in one mode for one for one need, and you may want to go to them in another um, mode, another need. So think about it. Um, uh, if you know, let's let's imagine that you're a uh, a student, and you're doing research on the pandemic that's ongoing let's say it's 2050 and you're you know looking back and you are going to do a, you're going to do a project on the uh on the pandemic um that's you know that's occurring now so you have a couple of different sources you can go, you can look at you know let's say there's a transcript of um dr anthony fauci testifying before congress uh a video um, that was posted by a 16 year old YouTuber talking about taking classes over Zoom. Um, a book published the previous year, um, you know, so 2049, comparing government response to COVID 
to previous and to um, and later uh, health emergencies. And then finally, a diary of an RN working in the ER during the pandemic. Um, so these are all different sources. And in the previous uh, webinar, we talked about um, sort of the way information is packaged and presented and sort of the pros and cons of different ways of constructing information. So with the sort of the list of these sources I just talked about, um, these are all individuals who have different levels and different modes of expertise and authority um, in terms of talking about the pandemic. So for example, Dr. Fauci, um, but you know, testifying before Congress, that is somebody who has you know, uh, expertise in the field of um, communicable diseases um, and somebody who has uh, you know, organizational authority by virtue of his position within the government and in the government response team. Uh, the 16 year old YouTuber has um, sort of lived experience. Um, they are, they, they're talking about how the pandemic is affecting them and giving you an insight into the way the pandemic was affecting um, high school students uh, and sort of the different ways that uh, the pandemic in, impacted their personal day-to-day -day life. Uh, the book comparing government response to COVID um, to previous and later health emergencies, you know, that, that is something that is putting it, uh, and you have expertise based on who the author of that book is, and it's putting information into context that, um, and then finally, the, the diary of uh, an RN who's working in the ER, again, you're getting, you're getting lived experience and you're getting subject expertise and you're getting it from a different perspective than what the high school student would be, how they would be perceiving things. So it's, um, again, so it, it's different levels of authority and different contexts in which their authority is um, manifesting itself in the work that they're, the information that they are putting out. And so when you ask, you know, which of these sources would you use for your projects? The big question is, what is the project, right? So what the context, what you need the information for means that you're gonna look at different, um, different authorities in different ways and what might be relevant for one um, information need is gonna be different than another one. So when we're talking about authority, we're talking about it being constructed and we're talking about it being contextual. Um, let me just close that up here. Um, so when we talk about what skills we want um, our students and our learners to take away from, uh, from this frame, what we want them to do is we want them to understand how authority is acquired. And so these are the different, sort of the different types of authority that we've been, um, that I was talking about. So subject expertise, uh, societal position, special experience, these are all different ways that people have of acquiring authority. And then also different ways that we can signal authority. So credentials, you know, does somebody have a PhD after their name? Um, their certifications, titles, badges. Um, these are all sort of ways that we can understand um, how or why an individual is an authority. Um, another thing we want our, uh, our learners to be able to do is to seek authoritative voices, but also to recognize that unlikely voices can be authoritative. So when we're talking about that, that special experience that somebody has, you know, um, the example that we saw that um, um, I see given a lot is that uh, if you're studying um, the effects of homelessness on the unhoused population, um, some, but you know, you can get, uh, you know, the, you know, there's you know, all the different ways of getting information that some may not have the impact that getting a, uh, you know, a uh, an interview with somebody who has experienced that, they are coming. Um, that is a different um, 
type of authority that that person has, that they can speak on homelessness, on being unhoused in a way that is different than um, somebody who studies it academically. Um, and again, so I'm recognizing that these different modes of authority are needed, um, different modes of authority are needed based on the context of the information need. Um, another skill uh, that we want our students to, to learn and to develop is um, a, a healthy skepticism of systems that elevate certain types of authority at the expense of others. Um, so, you know, whenever, uh, you know, as, as librarians, we get a lot of assist, we assist a lot with uh, students who are looking for uh, peer reviewed articles that you know the, the, the professor says that we have to find something that's scholarly, we have to find something that's, that's peer reviewed. And those are great. Those are, those are great resources to use, but not every project is going to need that type of authority. Um, and being open and being willing to look at, okay, what, what is the process for getting peer reviewed? Who gets peer reviewed? Um, who, you know, who is likely more or less likely to get published in you know, the more prestigious journals than in others? Um, what is the cost of getting, uh, of, you know, being able to do this type of research? Uh, you know, who is able to afford to do it? What are sort of, you know, what are the, uh, you know, the gates that people have to clear in order to be considered an academic and who is being left behind by that. Um, you know, obviously it doesn't mean that every, that, you know, there's no value in peer review or uh, in uh, scholarly work. And it doesn't mean that every, you know, that other voices, you know, are all you need, um, but being, being, being aware of the way that different types of systems are elevating certain types of authority at the expense of others. We see this a lot, um, especially in advertising. Um, you, you know, I, and I think students really do this. This is one of those frames where there's so much real world applicability that it's pretty easy to introduce into, um, into your classroom. You know, just if you look at things like advertising, uh, you know, if you're making, medical or health decisions for yourself or your family, voting, uh, making big purchases, you know, who are the voices that you're going to when it comes time to make big decisions? Um, you know, it's, it's definitely a frame that speaks a lot to, it has a lot of real world applicability and it speaks a lot to the way people live their lives. Um, and then the last is that this is a frame that um, really is empowering for students because it encourages them to recognize where they have authority themselves. What are they in authority on? Um, what are they working? You know, we talk about authority being constructed. What are they? What authority are they constructing for themselves? Um, you know, as they do their academic work, they are scholars. They are doing work that is making them an authority in certain topics. So how do they, how are they able to speak authoritatively on um, what they're researching? And to go along with that, so it's empowering and it's also important because it's what is their responsibility then as an authority? Um, you know, and this is as something as simple as, you know, when we talk about um, academic integrity, you know, we don't want people to be cheating or plagiarizing because, you know, you're not, you're not just a student who is doing this work so you can get a grade, you can get a job. What we really, what I hope a lot of us are doing is really driving home that, you know, you are a scholar, you know, this may be just a temporary step for you, you know, towards something else, what you are doing is you are building your own personal authority. Um, and hopefully alongside your own personal integrity, because there is a responsibility that comes along with being an authority. Um, so those are just some, some skills that we've pulled out um, from this frame that, um, you know, we really, in terms of working with, when we're working with our students, these are things that we would really like them to be um, developing. Um, so here's just an example of a couple of different ways we can introduce 
this room into a classroom. And just a really easy thing is having a discussion. You know, when we've talked before, what are you an authority on? Why? Um, you know, how have you built your, how you constructed your authority in, on that topic? Um, in what contexts would people, should people be coming to you to take advantage of your authority? Um, and then, where, and then also importantly, where do you not an authority on? You know, and then also why? You know, what sort of being self-aware, being aware of okay, being aware of where your your blind spots are. That because you're an authority on one thing does not mean that that authority is transferable to something else. Um, the the really fancy term for this is uh, non-overlapping magisterium. So the idea that you know your authority in one uh, topic, in this case, academic topic, is not transferable necessarily to uh, a different discipline. Um, you can definitely, you know, you can take your, the skills, your research skills that you've learned and developed in one uh, discipline, and those are transferable, but you, you have to start, you know, earn back your authority if, if you're, if you're um, moving between disciplines. So, um, so thinking about that, just thinking about just having discussion with your with your students and, you know, really letting them stop and think and, you know, um, you can introduce this when you're, like I said, mentioned before, when talking about um, academic integrity at the starting of at the start of the semester. You know, why are we so tough on plagiarism or or other forms of cheating? Um, that sort of thing. You know, why? What is your responsibility? And then, you know, you know, the empowerment that comes along with it, you know, you are an authority, you are a scholar. Um, and it sort of behooves you to behave in a certain way, you know, it comes with the responsibility. Um, the next uh, sort of lesson um, that I brought here is lateral reading, which is evaluating the source of information. And um, so I know a lot of people here are sort of are familiar with things like the crap test or other sort of tests for analyze when you are get have a piece of information, whether it's you know uh, an online news article or you know maybe a blog post or something, especially you know online where you're um, you know how do you quickly evaluate you know what's the current you know is it current information is it relevant information accurate that that sort of thing um what lateral reading does is it kind of it, in a way it almost skips all of that what lateral reading is is your take your the piece of information that you want to um um look at for you know when you when you're doing that when you're analyzing a source when you're evaluating a source um and you sort of basically, it's called lateral reading because you're basically just opening up a new window and you start researching the source of that first piece. So you look down and you say, okay, who published this? And then see what you can find out about who the author is. If it's an organization, you um, check the organization out and see, does it have any stated biases? Does it have any, um, what are the goals and the values of that organization that's, that's putting that information out into the world, um, because a lot of times when we, you know, you say like, who is the, um, when we have you evaluate a source, let's say it's um, you know a blog post about a controversial medical topic, and you scroll down, and you say, oh, this person's a doctor, okay, and it's a .dot org, um, and it seems to be you know has talks about you know has medicine in the title. Um, so lateral reading is sort of leaving all those signifiers that you might of authority that you might have that we sometimes ask students to evaluate. And we, you know, sort of, you know, think about it like, you know, you're in, you know, Windows, you open up a new window and you start researching the source, of, you're evaluating the source of your information by going by sort of, you know, you're doing reading about the reading. Uh, you're finding out. Um, you know, you're, you're sort of, you're digging in deep to find out, you know, um, the example that, so these, these are links, um, you'll be able to link to them in uh, when we share the uh, slides with everyone. 
Um, the lesson plan in this uh, for this particular one um, talks about they were evaluating a the, the class was evaluate is asked to evaluate uh, a website on um, they're talking about immigration and if you do once you start digging in so on the face of it the the website looks perfectly normal there's no red flags um but once you start digging into what is the source of that information who, you know who is the authority that is putting this information out um eventually it sort of uncovered that this is sort of um a very uh sort of you know, an extremely anti-immigration uh, organization that was actually classified by the uh, Southern Law Poverty Center um, as a hate group. So being aware of where is this information coming, who is who is sort of cashing in on the authority that they have constructed and, to, and what are they doing with it? How can, you know, is this somebody that is reliable and going beyond just, um, the signifiers of authority that we're used to analyzing. Um, so that's that's what lateral reading is, and it's um, uh, sort of a really great way of teaching uh, students to really sort of um, interact with material that they're presented with, and how to um, dig in deep than beyond some of the more surface level analysis that sometimes um, we use. Um, and finally, the last. Uh, uh, teachable thing is uh, talking about the gender gap in Wikipedia. And, you know, there's a lot of sort of talk in academic circles about um, Wikipedia. You know, is it reliable? Um, you know, can we use it in our papers? And, um, but regardless of whether or not you're actually citing Wikipedia in, you know, your papers or your research projects, a lot of people for a lot of, you know, even, you know, non academic work, especially. Um, are going to Wikipedia for, you know, as sort of a jumping off point or a first place to look at. Um, and what the gender gap in Wikipedia does is get, it's, um, sort of this assignment kind of works on uh, looking at who is being represented in Wikipedia, both in terms of what the content is. Um, uh, they, they go into sort of like, there's a lot of like statistics on um, not only gender bias, but also uh, uh, racial groups, LGBTQ groups, and individuals, um, and how they're underrepresented or systematically marginalized in Wikipedia. I believe the statistic that's given here is that um, only about a quarter of Wikipedia articles that are about people are uh, about women. Um, and then uh, also, so not only looking at the content of Wikipedia, but also who is creating the articles, who are the editors. Um, and so this, this assignment sort of um, students are required to uh, analyze and then make edits on articles in Wikipedia. Um, and sort of, and as part of that, looking at something that is considered, you know, it is a source of information, it is, an authority that a lot of people go to, if not to do, you know, the the deep academic work, but as a starting off point. But if you don't even have Wikipedia as your starting off point, what are you missing out on? What, um, you know, when we're talking about what voices aren't being heard, what are the, um, what is being sort of uh, like, what kind of what systems are. Um, being, are privileging certain types of authority over others. So this is a, that was a really cool assignment um, that I think um, students would be interested in because um, it is something that is relevant because a lot of students use it. Um, again, not necessarily for their academic work, but but for um, uh, you know just their as a jumping off point and day to day. Yep. I um, wanted to pause for a second and see if anybody had some questions. I think somebody said they might want to interact on one of the ideas here. Okay. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I I I tend to, if I get started, I tend to talk 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 talk. So <laughs> feel free to jump in and interrupt. Um, is there anything in the chat? Not a specific question. They just wanted to know if they were allowed to unmute. So I wanted to. 
Oh, okay. Oh, yes, to... yes. Unmuting is. Give them, give them a moment. Is it okay? We're this. This is being recorded. Um, I know. Uh, we got started, and some people have jumped joined in afterwards. Uh, the session is being recorded. If you want to ask your question on on camera, it'll be recorded. There'll be time afterwards if you want to wait until after the recording stops. We can do that too. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Glenn and Pete. Um, this is AD. I'm in the English department. Um, it's it's great to be here and uh, you know listen you listen listen to what you have to say and cook some ideas. Um, that's uh, that that's been you know making me conflicted these past few days. So you know I'm I'm particularly interested in the idea of constructing um, lateral um, reading uh, practices. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand that you know as as the person who sort of drives the conversation around authority, I am the author of authority and how it's developed as the teacher within within the classroom. So for instance, you know, I know that peer reviews are a good way of understanding who have been experts, who have been acknowledged as experts. And I think that the number of citations that you see in Google hits, for instance, would help you understand who are the experts in the field of knowledge construction that you are recommending students to look up, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm you know, curious to understand that authority is enmeshed in conversations around ethics and integrity and credibility, right? So I know that for sure that you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm guessing that all of us are following up the Harvard Crim Crimson news these days. And um, this relates to Professor uh, John Komaroff, a anthropologist and uh, who works in uh, African American studies, um, very big. Um, so if I were to write a, a anthropological uh, le leaning paper, um, academically speaking, then I cannot go without, you know, citing some of these authorities. But as the teacher, I already know that John Komaroff has come out as a sexual predator you know, hunting around students, graduate students. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my own biases, I, I know that research has to be objectively informed and that the construction of authority, um, you know, even if the construction of authority is also objectively driven by a set of data points, I also want to enmesh that idea with um, ethics and integrity. So as the teacher, you know, and as the teacher who has access to who would be a known expert in the field and having known, in, you know, in, and, and having access to this background information, you know, I'm somewhat hesitant to sort of keep on citing this guy or to even say that, you know, look him up, look his work, look at his work, you know, the, the, the politics of citation here, the politics mm -hmm. of strategically including, excluding, and you know, making some people more visible over others in the field of scholarship and constructing knowledge, I think that 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 is an is a gray area in my head right now. I'm I'm just very very conflicted that you know I've I've definitely read blurbs that other people have written, um, vetting those works by these people. So I, I you know I I I, I don't want to bring in my biases or my the, the particular ideas and experiences about ethics and integrity, um, uh, but I cannot know uh, how not to do it either, because if I were an anthropologist um, training to be one in a graduate class, as the teacher, should I or should I not, you know, encourage students to keep on using um, the people who are known to be more damaging as individuals or however rewarding they might be as colors. So, you know, I, I don't know where, where we should go with, with lateral reading. Um, uh, and I would be curious to see what this, you know, uh, this, this body thinks about it. Um, yeah. Oh, that, that is a great point. Um, I know I just, for me personally, like, uh, you know, I we I just did a presentation at uh, an American Library Association conference about looking at uh, the um, at the time we, we it was sort of presenting a a, a Q and A that we had um, put together for uh, questions on book challenges to books based on 
uh, things that the author may have done outside their role as an author. Um, so we're, we're, you know, the not challenges based on the content of the work itself, but, um, you know, when the author, you know, has gone on Twitter and says something wild or, you know, says something that, you know, is offensive or problematic in some way. Um, and then coming back to, you know, what what is your responsibility then as a li as uh, as a library worker? Um, so I was giving it on behalf of the intellectual freedom, uh, uh, the Office for Intellectual Freedom, the Intellectual Freedom uh, Committee of ALA. So from that perspective, we leaned fairly heavily towards um, that you know uh, censoring uh, individuals um, who know generally against it, but it is. It is a sort of a hot button topic, not just in you know anth uh, anthropology, but in a lot of different disciplines. Uh, Dr. Turpin has their hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, and so I am also um, a professor in the English department, and um, there are a couple of words that just kind of may not necessarily be one that. Um, that you all may see as problematic. Um, but one that I wanna kind of point out um, in light of what um, we've been discussing lately, that word authoritative, um, very problematic. Um, and why is it problematic? Because historically speaking, it is a word that ha has been used and it, purported meaning used as a way of kind of closing the door on voices, whether or not you happen to work in academia and whether or not you happen to be a researcher. And so that word has been used to exclude certain voices certain publications, certain possibilities of being able to publish in peer reviewed journals, in um, certain books that don't get published because quite simply, the author or authors do not come from those who have been deemed as authoritative, very often having less to do with quote unquote credentials and more to do with where they happen to be sitting, um, yeah. in terms of um, in, in terms of institutions, um, and quite frankly, in terms of gender, race, sexuality, social class, religion, everything. Yeah, Dr. Turpin, that is exactly what this is about. I think one of the explicit things in this frame is that as somebody increases their information literacy. Um, behaviors and understanding that they're going to recognize the gaps where voices have been left out of the conversation, um, where, where people who should be an authority on something have not been allowed to for one reason or another. I think that's a great observation, and it's exactly one of the reasons why this uh, threshold concept really, really matters for students. Also counts um, just in terms of well, the question as to who gets to speak, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who gets to be you know considered, um, and this is an issue not just for our students but for those of us who are um, currently conducting research, currently um, publishing and presenting, and so I would say that. Perhaps um, there needs to be um, a more inclusive um, set of words, set of languages, set of uh, another way of, of being able to talk to students about um, making wise decisions um, about um, you know, their sources. And to be in plain English, if the only people who get that authority are white, heterosexual, upper class Christian men um, or white, heterosexual, um, upper class men, um, then that kind of suggests that 
there is no room um, when it comes to their voices and that in order for them to be considered to be um, quote unquote professional or uh, to be taken seriously, that they have to somehow um, replicate those same um, voices and those same um, people um, who are engaging in practicing in exclusive um, exclusive um, mm-hmm. practices make sense yeah 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 I think I mean this this is an interesting frame for a social justice consideration very much because of the historic um, exclusion from credentialing processes for example like how difficult was it for certain groups to even get the credentials to be allowed to speak in a you know peer-reviewed academic setting um, that's my point. That's my point. All of that. That this is I, one of the really interesting things about this entire framework for information literacy is the very, very strong recognition of that problem. That it's a social justice undercurrent in it, which I think is a beautiful part of it. Yeah, if you, I mean, and what we're talking about, even if we want to go to this last, uh, you know, this this last one we talked about, the gender gap in Wikipedia, you know, something with really the bit where the barrier to entry is theoretically really low like anybody could edit wikipedia anybody can make you know create a wikipedia page but then why are the majority of you know we can talk about why are the majority of not you know not again not just even the subject matter but the people that are actually the editors of wikipedia you know the uh the statistics are are i think they're in the lesson plan here so if we open that up um uh, I hate to interrupt. Yeah. Are we asking that same question when it comes to peer reviewed journals, um, quote unquote authoritative um, academic um, research uh, websites? Are we doing the same thing? Or are we only doing it when it comes to pop culture, popular, uh, popular websites? Because if we're not, then that itself reinforces mm. issues and problems. That is a great point. Um, yeah, I, I went through and I picked out just a couple like ways of bringing this up in class. But I mean, if obviously, you know, almost as a way to like ease people in, but really uh, you're absolutely right that, you know, if you're, if we are only doing, uh, talking about these issues in a certain context, um, you know, we're not, we're obviously we're missing, you know, the, the broader, um, context and in a lot of ways um in a lot of ways more relevant context that um of what we're talking about yeah because the, the thing is is that if we're saying oh well you know if you want something that's more reliable um more gender inclusive more lgbtqia plus inclusive um more culturally um inclusive you know more um race or caste inclusive, if we're saying that and saying, well, you should go to those peer review journals and those anthologies and texts that have been published um, by academic sources that are also peer reviewed, if we're saying that, um, the expectation would be that those who are conducting the peer review, those who are conducting the research um, and those who are publishing from um, an academic perspective would be more inclusive. Is that the case? However, I think not. You've entered into the big conversation on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's part of why this has written the way it is so that it can give a framework for having that conversation going forward in a little more overtly i'd say a lot more um overtly because at this stage if we're not doing that um what we're doing is actually contributing to the continuation of practices um when it comes to making decisions as to who actually um gets an audience who actually gets to um 
to participate in the conversation. Yeah, and I think there's the issue too of um, the reactions of powers that be when you demonstrate that their dominance is not legitimate or has caused harm. I think there's the reactions can be varied and harmful <laughs> or not harmful as it were, depending on what they do. Yep. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that pos those possibilities as well, you know, uh, but, you know, how, how do we bypass that? Because I'm also looking at, you know, I, I don't know if you follow the way the citation systems that we use in the humanities. <clears throat> so MLA and APA have now incorporated the ways to cite um, oral histories and lived experiences, right? So which means that citational databases or peer review credibility weightages have now shifted or perhaps expanded to include native voices, which usually do not find archival presence, right? So, so at the same time, you know, if you're not in a fieldwork based subject, you know, you are only constructing a certain kind of knowledge that allows you to hierarchize and keep on, you know, giving prominence to a certain kind of technique that builds a certain kind of knowledge. So I think that that knowledge as an active, inclusive uh, way of being better. Um, I think that, that 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 you know, where should I lead students as the teacher, as the cognate, you know, with with the as a person cognate with authority in the classroom. Where should I, you know, lead students to sort of unearth, recover those voices that are usually not part of the traditional research framework, right? So lived stories, lived experiences, um, indigenous knowledge systems, because they are not written out and neither have they found their entryways into traditional citational systems and knowledge databases, including the ones that we find in library databases. Right, so 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 uh, you know, do we do we lead them to digital media resources? Do we lead them to lead them to projects that talk about transnational collaborations way before archival systems were constructed uh, in the in the you know modern world? Um, I was recently uh, reviewing a book that is talking about um, oral histories of Southern Black women that moved into Philadelphia, moved to Philadelphia and how recovery of those voices also meant that you are placing those voices in an archive that has characteristically only listed, cited, and given prominence to oral histories of settlers, white settlers in that part of the nation. And so the history of migration the history of the north-south divide, you know, we have categorically outed these other voices from the construction of that history. So how do you then revise, you know, your archival presence? Um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the history of the American Library Association's uh, systems of, you know, the, the history of public libraries, for instance, in the US. So that had, you know, had, uh, had African-Americans construct their own libraries run by their own people reading books that they could have access to. So are we having some kind of a, some kind of an integration, some kind of a um, thing that says that all these other knowledge systems, all these other knowledge systems and other languages, you know, that I could give my students access to or perhaps speak of the possibilities of, you know, uh, can happen with the help of an archive close to them, near to them. Yeah, that's, uh, that is, yeah, that's, that is a great insight. Um, and that actually kind of ties into future um, uh, frames that we're going to be talking about in this series. I'm thinking specifically of, uh, there's one that's titled, uh, Scholarship is a Conversation. Um, the introducing students to the idea that as a scholar, as a person, you no, know, as a person, you are when you're interacting with the body of scholarship, you are it is a conversation that you're having with people who came before you. And if you can find those pieces that may be people who have been excluded from that conversation, how bringing those in, and also uh, research as inquiry, um, the idea of you know how do you what questions are you asking. Um, you know, because research is about asking questions and, you know, looking for gaps in the record, looking for gaps in that conversation that we've been talking about. So we are going to be talk 
bringing, I think, more specifically about the issues that um, um, both of you are, are bringing up, and they're really great uh, topics. And they, all these sort of all these frames work together. Like the idea is that they're they're all scaffolding information literacy, and a lot of the ideas behind them are really, like I said, looking at, you know, what are the gaps here? Who has been excluded? How do we how do we bring people in? How do we sort of shine a light on you know what has been left out? Um, you know, like what with um, the one we did previously, um, Megan talking about what are the form, you know, what are the form, how is information packaged? Um, and sort of, you know, who is that information being packaged for? Who is the target audience there? Who, and then this one is sort of looking at who is the one, who are packaging, who's packaging that information? And why do we privilege uh, one person who's creating information or creating knowledge, creating content over another person? Um, and looking at the different ways, you know, we have a look of analyzing, you know, who is talking about something from a, uh, from a credible place, from a valid place, from a, a place that makes sense. And then, and, you know, like you're noticing what are the problems here and how can we work to overcome this going forward? So these are all really great points. Um, so I do want to talk just real brief. Um, when we send out the the slides for this, it will have links to, again to the HR Sandbox and Project Cora. There are hundreds of lesson plans and uh, in class projects and blog posts and articles and all sorts of great stuff on all the different uh, um, uh, the frames that are talk um, that are available here. Um, so if you you know find something that seems interesting, you can uh, you know include it in one of your classes. If you create something that you think matches up with one of the uh, frames that we're talking about, um, that's also there. I also put a link here to this YouTube video. It was only like three minutes long. It was put together by another school doing a series similar to this one, and I think it really touches on a lot of what we're talking about. What you no know, kind of well you know we've been talking about what I've been talking about for the last like you know 50 minutes but in like a three minute video that maybe you know is an easy way to introduce this to um to students get them thinking about this um about you know who is speaking and where and why and you know who isn't being look looked at who is being you know overly valued just being undervalued um and where do they fit into this um do we have any other questions? Um, Thank you for presenting. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, we, I think when just when we got started, there wasn't anybody on, so we were, I was a little worried. I was me just talking to to nobody, you know, talking to the talking to the PowerPoints. But uh, you no, know, thank you for thank you for coming and thank you for making these uh, these great points. Uh, I'm going to put the uh, assessment form in the group chat, in the chat here, and I'm going to, like I said, we may have a recording will be available, and anybody who attended live will be getting a certificate of attendance. Um, so I'm going to turn off screen sharing. Um, and stop recording too, probably. Yeah, yeah, let's stop recording, and then if you have any other questions or comments um, that you want to make off camera, we can do that too. So I'm going to stop recording right now.